Hey guys, welcome back to the Q&A series once again. Uh, for those who don't know, you can send your questions into KeithBallardQuestions at gmail.com. The email is listed in the description and should be on screen somewhere. Uh, this is where I answer questions that people email in to me, and I play some irrelevant game that's usually something that I probably wouldn't do a series on anyway because it's kind of not commentary friendly or static or something like that. This is Zenbound 2. It's real weird. Let's just get into it, I suppose, and you'll see what we're getting at here. I can't be this confused about how to start a level. Apparently that's where you start the level, not the light. Okay, this is Zenbound 2. It's really weird. Here is a wooden figure with a rope tied to it. I literally... I'm supposed to just, like, rotate it so that it gets wrapped with a rope. That's what this game is. It's, uh, the number one example that comes to mind of, or at least the first example that comes to mind, of, uh, how did this get in my Steam library game. This predates being a YouTuber, it predates even Steam Summer Sales being a thing, I think, but I, I assume at some point, I must have been just giddy with the idea that some game was probably like a couple of dollars on sale, and that was a foreign concept to me at the time, because because even Steam, even Steam Summer Sales weren't a big thing yet, which, fittingly enough, is what's going on right now, probably why I thought of this game. And, uh, so I probably was like, oh my god, f cheap game, just like how when I first got my, f my first smartphone, I started downloading a bunch of games for free, and didn't even question whether or not they were worth downloading, and had so many bullshit, terrible garbage games on my phone for a while that I never played because there was no reason to hoard all these free games, but that's what happens when you're... It's almost like when you first start making money uh, as a young adult and you're like, oh my god, I can buy my own games now and stuff like that. That seemed to be what's going on. So it's a very relaxing... I wouldn't even call it a puzzle game necessarily, but it's just a methodical game where you're supposed to try to slowly wrap a thing in a rope. And you have a total, you have a total limit on how much rope you have, it's as per this bottom right corner. And then over here it tells you your percentage of rope coverage, which I don't think I would say is entirely accurate right now, because it claims I have 81% coverage, apparently. Although it doesn't appear to be getting any higher either, so I'm not really sure how its percentage works. Now it's going a little higher. Yeah, I'm a little confused about what its uh, percentage rule is, but that's it. So that's what this game is. I, I just one day looked at my uh, Steam in, uh, library back when I probably had like 200 games and I was like, what is this and how did I get it? Right next to Zombie Driver and a few other confusing games I don't remember, actually remember buying, but I must have because I wasn't getting any kind of review codes back then. Uh, nowadays, I have like over a thousand games, so it's really normal. I just wake up to weird codes for indie games and Kickstarter projects and stuff like that, so it's much more par for the course, but this will always be memorable as like the weird first example. Let's go ahead and move on. I got far in Well, there's more flowers the further I get. That's the progression system. All right, so now finally to our first question. <laughs> After this weird introduction, uh, Fox Soul asks a penguin walks through that door right now wearing a towering pillar of hats. What does he say and why is he here? Well, I have, I assume I, I, uh, associate too many hats with the concept of Valve, basically. So I would assume it's something that has to do with PC market. And if it's related to the PC market, then I would then assume that it's some indie developer trying to get me to sp uh, to pimp the Kickstarter of his game. Because that's really like my average interaction with developers at this point is just a constant barrage of emails of people wanting to me to basically act, act as their as a as a portion of their PR, basically, which I mean I get it. It's a tough market out there, but boy oh boy, uh, there's so many of them. And honestly, some of the pro all the projects I hear about just aren't very promising, and I don't really want to associate my name with them just to, for the sake of being nice. I guess I don't know. That's a weird direction for that question, but also it's a really bizarre question. I don't know. <laughs> What kind of answer was expected to begin with? So I hit the 50 centimeter mark, so I guess we might as well continue. If I can figure out how to continue. Ooh, 93%. Look at that progress. How is it still going up? 
I don't think I understand how this game actually works. Oh well. I don't know how to end this. I thought you click on the shiny thing, but it won't let me. Oh, I think I need to take the rope to the shiny thing. Whoops. My bad. There we go. Ta-da! First level down. Oscar Sweeta asks, have you started reading the Witcher books? If so, what do you think of them so far? Nope. I'm a terrible human being who got every single Witcher book for Christmas in a giant collection, and I still haven't started them. They're in a big lineup, and I am very annoyed with myself for not having read them yet. Maybe one day I'll have an update on that. But, uh, so far, no. I'm really bad at, uh... I'll just generally say I'm not a very well-read person. I don't... Reading is not a part of my schedule as much as I would, I, was, I, was, I would like it to be. Oh, that was weird. So, as a general rule, like, I just... Because I don't read books super often, I'm I'm really bad at working them into my schedule in any real way. I just don't think about like, oh yeah, it's, it's reading time, that regular reading time. I don't have that necessarily. I should probably be re reading as I prep for bed. Uh, and for some reason, that's never been that hasn't been what I do for a long time. I don't think I've read a single book since I moved for my job two years ago. Whereas like. Uh, before then, it was actually much more common for me to read than it is now. I don't know why I dropped off so hard compared to before, but I... I just probably just keeping busy. There's always so many things you want to do. Shows you want to keep up with, job, work stuff, meeting with friends and stuff like that. I always feel like I always... I never have as much time as I'd like to have for basically anything. Uh, and I guess reading has been one of the biggest casualties of that, because I... I was actually excited to read the Witcher books, and I got them in, and I got them as a gift, and I still haven't even like opened them really. I think touching each of these knobs just sets off the paintball, and that leads to percentage completion instead of rope this time. Weird. So yeah, one day maybe I'll read them. Uh, Charlie the Unicorn asks, "Was the game that you would say got you into gaming? Uh, probably Duck Hunt, I guess." As a kid, we had an original Nintendo. I think I covered this last episode, actually. And so, like, I just... That was something I got. So, like, my first video game was, like, a peripheral-based uh, shooter and stuff like that. So, controller gimmicks are not a foreign concept to me, because that's how I started with video games. Uh, probably my most played experience as, when I was younger was probably something more along the lines of uh, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 1989 arcade game. We were tiny children, so we were stupid and useless and couldn't really play the game properly, necessarily. But at the time, what we would do is, uh, we had a game genie, and so we would play- we, I would play co-op with my brother, and we would go through, uh, we would go through that game... Looks like the balls are on the thing now? Okay. We would go through that game in, with uh, infinite lives turned on, basically. Uh, so that would, that would counteract how useless we were being dumb children that are bad at things. Because kids uh, can be appallingly bad at video games until they spend, spend a certain number of years at them. And then their freakish, nightmarish, uh, reflexes make them ungodly super beasts at video games until they get a little older. And then once they're old enough to appreciate video games, they start sucking at them a little bit more again. Hooray! <laughs> These are going by quickly. But yeah, it was probably... Probably my first... My first video game was probably the, uh... Mario Duck Hunt cartridge. And, uh... Duck Hunt was more sharing-friendly for siblings, because you could switch back and forth... ...in shorter games than Mario, necessarily. And then, uh... Like, I played Ninja Gaiden, but it was too hard, because I was a little kid. And... So, like, the the dumb, like, let's run around and beat stuff up and feel like we're going... We're, like, we're accomplishing stuff was probably a pretty good fit for uh, Ninja Turtles. So I would say that's probably the answer. Let's see... That's... I'm definitely gonna mispronounce this name. Because it's not familiar, but uh, Wojciech Fautnowski? I would... S is probably close, maybe. Uh, I always wondered, why do you play so much JRPGs and anime-like games? Do you like the style or usual gameplay mechanics of these games? Uh, um, 
This this so this question got me by surprise actually because I was like, am I known for being a a JRPG player? Is that a thing I do? So I had to like think about it for a little while, and I, the the question's probably somewhat informed by recent occurrences of having played games like uh, at one point I had Legend of Zelda, uh, Breath of the Wild, Tales of Vesperia. And Yakuza 0 going on at the same time, so I guess that would probably feel like I'm playing a bunch of anime games or something. Historically on the channel, I, I would say a relatively small number of my games are... Uh, ...Japanese in the first place, let alone uh, JRPG or anime-like. Uh, and that's informed primarily by the fact that I play those... Uh, I make those every game I played in 2015 and 2016 videos, and they are these ungodly monster projects that take a ton of time to put together and so I know for a fact that there's just so many games covered on these channels and a relatively small number of them are JRPGs or Japanese in the first place. Uh, admittedly, that's a genre where the games in it tend to stick around for a while because they're very long in many cases. So it can feel like I'm playing a lot of them because of the fact that like Final Fantasy 15 or Tales of Vesperia can take a while to play through, but generally, uh, I've played a relatively small number of them on the channel, and they've always been a minority thing. But it also depends on what your exact your exact definition is of uh, JRPG or anime like, because like some people might claim that like that like Zelda is anime like, I guess, with its art style, maybe. But I wouldn't really necessarily say that. And also, people would argue whether or not it's an RPG or not. I've, it's surprisingly common for people to argue that Zelda games are not RPGs. I kind of think they are. Uh, but also, I think that arguing over exact definitions of genres can be kind of more trouble than it's worth at times because of how finicky it is and how, it, in, in some way, every AAA, or every, every AAA video game is becoming an RPG on some level in the ways that don't matter as much. And at some point, it becomes very hard to figure out what an RPG is because, and I know this because I'm, I've tried to make a channel about playing RPGs. Uh, Western RPGs are easier to, to identify because they have some. They often have a level of D and D influence, and there's a element of actual role playing where you play a role and make decisions and stuff like that, at which some of them screw up. But it's generally part of the conceit of the game on some level. Uh, JRPGs are actually really hard to con define because modern AAA adventure games of any kind, or action adventure games from the Western, from the West Coast, often are now sharing similar features with JRPGs. And that the primary things that may seem to make a JRPG an RPG are like the part where like you level up from getting experience and get some skills, but otherwise you don't really impact the story in any meaningful way, and you just watch it as a series of cutscenes, and it's largely non-interactive. And so what's getting confusing there is that, like, that, like, on a weird level, like, games like Shadow of Mordor are becoming just, and Batman Arkham Asylum are, like, just as much RPGs on some level as uh, JRPG is. And so, like, the definition of what makes one the other, one what or not, like, it's really, it's really baffling now, trying to make it clear which one's which and why. So I've, lo I've lost track of the definition a little bit. As far as anime-like, that's, yeah, I don't know if, if uh, we specifically mean cel-shaded stuff and cartoony animated drawing, things like uh, Grand Kingdom and Tales of Vesperia, or if, like, Yakuza maybe counts because it's just all Japanese voice acting and Japanese storytelling, or, or Zelda and stuff like that. But uh, talking about the general concept of the question, as opposed to trying to define what it might mean and which games it might refer to, um, as a general rule, I don't think I'm making any more progress here. I don't think I. Uh, I think I do like a lot of design aspects of Japanese development, but not specifically Japanese RPGs. I uh, found myself bounce bouncing off Japanese games that are called RPGs, but I'm more interested in the quirky designs of their other genres. Cause like, I love the part of, uh, even if, I'm about to cite games I haven't even played, which is a bad example, but, like, I love the the quirk that puts together stranger games like Shadow of the Colossus, or Katamari Damashi, or even something like the, uh, Zero Escape series, like, seeing games like those exist is the part of Japanese de development that I enjoy, uh, but the J JRPGs, by contrast, 
are weirdly formulaic, which is weird to think about, because, like, Japanese development often has been great at completely defying uh, formula. It's one of the cool things of, about playing Japanese games, and even, like, sometimes one of the cool things about, like, playing whatever offering comes up from Nintendo from time to time is seeing what weird direction they might decide to go, on, go in. Uh, so it's weird to see how oftentimes Japanese development often is able to throw convention out the window and do really crazy, inventive, weird things with its projects in a way that uh, AAA Western studios are often less willing to do. But the moment they're making a JRPG, they have a often a really strict formula and list of things, and uh, and oftentimes for some reason they have issues with like maybe even incoherent stories, and like there's there's a, I've had issues with uh, a lot of the JRPGs I've played so far. To the point where, like, I actually have trouble naming JRPGs I've been entirely happy with. Like, uh... What was it? Like, Final Fantasy XV had massive glaring issues that you will have heard if you watched my series. I, I, it kept getting longer. Uh, Grand Kingdom was just kind of tedious and un uninteresting. Uh, Final Fantasy t Zero Type Z uh, Final Fantasy Type Zero was a gargantuan trash fire at some point. It just kept getting more problematic, too. Tales of Zestiria was mostly just kind of boring, uh, and a little too bizarre with its combat system, but, like, wasn't outright bad, and Tales of Vesperia, like, is not a game that I genuinely- I, I wouldn't say I genuinely love. I wouldn't- I wouldn't, like, write- I'm not gonna, like, write home about Vesperia, really, but, uh, it was a great improvement on Zestiria, and I- I enjoyed it on that- I, like, I was- I was complimenting on that premise, at least, that it was such a leap forward. But, uh, when I think about my favorite experiences of the year, I don't really think of JRPGs. What, like, even, like, I, I, like, I, years go by and I, I always think about making a top 10 list, and I never end up making one. But when I'm thinking about my top 10 list that never gets made, I think about all these different games, and none of them are the Japanese RPGs that I played that year. And so that's been a disappointment. Uh, this year might be an exception completely based on the idea of whether or not, uh, people think that, uh, Breath of the Wild counts as a JRPG. I kind of think it does? I don't know. I guess I say- I would- I would more say I think it counts as an RPG, at, on some level at least. Uh, but I'm often confused as to whether or not JRPGs can- are just RPGs made in Japan, because people argue against me when I say- because, like, I'll, I'll, I'll be inclined to say my favorite uh, JRPG is Demon's Souls. But then people will be like, Soulsborne's games don't count as JRPGs. And I'm like, but they're Japanese role-playing games. In fact, the uh, Soulsborne franchise has more role-playing in it than most JRPGs ever made. Because you can actually make decisions that affect the story. Which is at actually a level of role-playing. And you can join covenants and make decisions throughout the thing. And that seems like the whole point, right? But anyway, uh, I will say that, so, uh, this is meandering, but that's because the topic's kind of meandering, and it, it, ref it completely centers around multiple hard-to-define concepts, but, so I'm just sort of vamping on my general thoughts on the entire premise, is basically what we're, where we're at right now. How do I tie off this thing, if it's, like, stuck? I don't know if I can, but, uh, as I would say, if I talk about the aesthetic, I would say that I'm not particularly interested in uh, JRPG trope slash anime trope uh, aesthetic. And the aesthetic is definitely not why I play the games. I'm not generally interested in anime. Uh, I got into Dragon Ball Z when I was a kid, like a lot of people did, watching like Toonami. And so I would see like Dragon Ball Z and Yu Yu Hakusho, and eventually would find like Adult Swim to see like the other realm of available anime, and of course, found, uh, Full Metal Alchemist, which is... But they're both are pretty fantastic, both versions of that. But, um... I don't generally watch much anime because... I... The tropes get to me at some point, and, like, they're... Like, everything has tropes, but almost none of the tropes of anime really appeal to me directly. I don't like over-exaggerated expressions and the constant shouting, and I don't really like, like, the weird, like... 
cost-saving measure animation they do where they're like, this person's very emotional or shouty about this thing, so we're gonna draw them flailing and it's gonna be two alternating frames of animation with their and their face is gonna be an emoticon where they're just an X and their mouth is open and like that's saved on, that's how we save on our animation budget and if we trick our audience into being really into it, then we can save so much money on, on our art. Uh... I've, I've, I, I've experienced the addictive quality of, like, shonen anime with the, the power levels and whatnot from, from early on, and, uh, I can't really ride that loop anymore. Like, I've done it a few times. I watched Yu Yu Hakusho, I watched Dragon Ball Z and a few other things, and I can't, I can't deal with, or Bleach. I can't deal with another anime about a protagonist that has a series of friends and keeps gaining new powers just in the nick of time to defeat the next bad guy that they surely can't beat, but then they beat, like... I, I get why it's addictive, but I can't loop that anymore. And so, I generally, if, if I ever experience anime on any level, it's gonna be something that has, like, some sort of unique story or premise that is distinctly not about... Like, I'll watch it not because it's anime, but because somebody made something interesting that happens to be an anime. And that's unfortunately not always the case. The last anime I think I watched, uh, all the way through, uh, which is not entirely true because it was cancelled, but I watched through Gangsta, which, uh, was, it was cancelled, so if I wanted to follow up on that, I need to go track down manga for it, but I enjoyed Gangsta, because it was this nice, realized individual world, and it was this distinctly just, it was just a drama set in a vaguely, I don't know if we'd call it sci-fi, but like that that Bioshock-ish thing where you- or- or Dishonored type thing where you just invent a new world, basically. Uh... I don't think it was aggressively sci-fi, but it was just one of those- it was just in the territory of being, like, a fully separate world, like Attack on Titan or Dishonored and stuff like that, where you just make the whole thing from scratch and... you call it whatever you want to call it. Uh, Gangsta was neat. It literally- it not, not only did it end in a cliffhanger, it, mid, it ended mid-jump. A character was jumping from rooftop to rooftop, and it cuts out, and it's like, it's supposed to be a cliffhanger for the next episode, and then the animation studio went under, and so that series is presumably dead forever. Like, I'll watch a thing like that. Uh, I definitely am not taking anime recommendations. Don't throw those my way. This is not, this is not directed at the person asking the question, probably, but just all the people that will inevitably respond to the fact that I'm mentioning anime. Uh, Generally, recommendations from other people that are into anime about what anime to watch do not work for me. Because, uh, frankly, I find I find that generally human beings are really bad at recommending stuff. People mostly just recommend things that they like, and because they like you, they think that, they, that you'll like the thing that they like. This happens with video games a lot, too, actually. I get a lot of video game recommendations like, I'm sure you would like this, and I'm like, why do you think that? I'm like, and I look at the thing, and I'm like, it's, it's completely and wholly outside of anything that I would ever be interested in on any level, and I'm completely confused as to why the person thinks I would like it, and they can't justify it, because, like, we'll be in literally in chat in real time, and I'll be like, okay, so why do you think I would be into this? And they basically don't have a reason, and I quickly realize that the entire reason is just because they like my stuff, and they like this thing, so they think that the transitive property of liking things, I'll like that stuff, and that's not... That's just not how things work, and that's just setting people up for heartbreak of that cringe, not cringe, but that, that hard to experience moment when you're recommending something to someone and then you're experiencing them not actually really care about the thing and like, no, because I've, I've experienced that, that frustration too. And it's, uh, it's hard to realize when you're stumbling into that general idea. Also, I'm so, I'm so meandering at this point that I'm barely aware of even what the original topic was. Let's get away, let's try to get far away from anime for a bit. As far as JRPGs specifically, on a mechanical level, uh, I, I find most JRPGs frustrating mechanically, and so I've, I've largely been unhappy with how a lot of them work. Uh, I feel like JRPGs often have a tendency to overcomplicate themselves for the sake of overcomplicating themselves, or they have... Or if the mechanics aren't that complicated, they often are way too bad at explaining... <clears throat> explaining themselves. One of the things that always flies, comes to mind is when I, I played, uh... When I was in that earlier, that period I talked about earlier, where you, uh, start making money and you're like, I'm gonna buy my own video games. I had that obligatory moment where I'm like, I'm gonna buy long RPGs that are, that are used at GameStop so I can get the most time for my money. And I quickly learned that that's not the great, best way to do things because... 
uh, you don't get around to playing them on some level in many cases, but uh, I got Star Ocean 4? The one that I don't think has the number 4 on it, but it's called like Star Ocean The Last Hope or something like that. Uh, that game opens up with like a one hour long tutorial. And like you haven't experienced story yet, you have no idea what the combat's like, and it sets it up as being the most complicated, nightmarish game ever. And then, by the time it was time to start the game, I just had fatigue at that point. But, uh, that- I think that was actually a surprisingly simple, like, hack-and-slash game that was, like, basically overcomplicating things by way over-explaining every minute detail that didn't actually matter about its combat system, because it was way too far up its own ass about how important everything in its system was. Uh, almost like how Assassin's Creed games that will keep adding all these extraneous details to each sequel at, from time to time. So... But then you have really, like, there are, there are JRPGs where I, I, I will, like, practically beat the game and still not fully understand what its combat system is supposed to work like at times. That's definitely happened a few times. And, uh, when I look at my shelf of, like, weird crap, like, I, I have, uh, I have The Last Remnant on my shelf. And I'm trying to think of, like, what was that one game, uh... Uh, the nat- was it called The Natural Doctrine or something like that? It was like a baffling video game. Uh, I think it was called Doctrine at the very least. Uh... What else is coming to mind? Uh, freaking... Oh god, uh, Grand Kingdom with its way too many classes and its weird, like, just not very well made combat system. Uh... I'm trying to think of some of the weird ones, there's a... I think there was a Resonance of Fate or something it was like a turn-based shooter RPG XCOM thing like that's just blah. I uh some of these games are games I haven't even really actually picked up and played yet, so like I don't know if they're genuinely co complicated. But like there's a there's a thing that happens for some reason where I'll look at a JRPG that I ha like if I haven't played it and if I watch its combat, I like I literally can't tell what's happening and. I look at Western games, and I'm like, oh yeah, I get it immediately. And I don't know what that is. I don't know if it's because JRPGs are completely up their own ass with weird complications, or if it's just a cultural divide of some kind, and it's like, that's those are mechanics that are somehow intuitive to Japanese audiences and not Western audiences or something. Because, like, XCOM is technically, on some level, a complicated game, but, or, or Wasteland and stuff like that, but I can just look at them and I'm like, yeah, that's what's happening each turn, that thing's happening, and that guy's behind cover, and all that's happening, but I look at, uh, I try to tell what's happening mechanically in a lot of JRPGs but by sight, and I'm like, what is going on? And, unfortunately, sometimes I'll pick them up and play them, and I'll still not know what's going on for hours, which is not a great experience as a Let's Play, because that just leads to a lot of people yelling at me in the comments. Not just while it's happening, but then for literally months and years afterwards, I'm still getting, like, uh, I still constantly get flack for that one time I played, uh, uh, Valkyria Chronicles about every little mistake or thing I didn't quite understand, where people are just so mad at me for not being the super ubermensch of that game or whatever. Uh, I don't know what the divide is there, but, uh... Generally, I'm not having great experiences with Japanese RPGs outside of specifically Zelda and Dark Souls. And, uh, I... As a result, I find myself most likely going to be, like, shying further and further away from Japanese RPGs as a whole. Uh, as for why I played so many of them for a while, despite not being an active fan of a lot of what they do, uh, I was growing my channel, and I was just... The general approach was I would just try to keep an eye out on new RPG releases as, as they were coming out. And then as they would come out, I'd be like, uh, do I have time for that? Sure, add that to the pile! And then suddenly you have me playing Tokyo Mirage Sessions, and, uh... Uh, gr uh, Grand Kingdom, and all these other- and Odin Sphere, and all these other games that... Wouldn't necessarily be on my top priority list if I had to choose from a short- from a short list of games, uh, uh or for short list, list of slots, what to play. Uh, but at the time, I was like, ah, keep throwing things on the pile and we'll see how things work out. And, uh, some of that stuff really did work out. But, uh, nowadays, I'm now switching to a new structure for the channel, which I hope will be an experiment that pays off, ultimately. Because right now, I'm trying to go for the whole, let's not play games Let's not try to rush to play every game the moment it comes out, and let's have a specific, constrained schedule of what games I'm going to play. 
and uh, do six videos per day on the main schedule at least, plus or minus collaborations, things like that. And so as a result, uh, I have to be choosy now a bit more than I was before about which games that I actually say yes to. And that kind of choosiness, I don't think would result in me playing a game like uh, Grand Kingdom or Stranger of Sword City, for example. Because I'd be like, no, let's save that slot for something else. You'll probably still see Japanese games on this channel. Like, I, there's a decent chance I'll get around to playing the Nanari games at some point. And Shadow of the Colossus and Ico. And uh, future Zelda games, although that'd be a while. But maybe, maybe eventually past Zelda games. But JRPGs. Uh, I might have to reach into the past if I play any more on the channel. Because there are supposed to be some really cool ones in the past. Once upon a time, I really enjoyed Golden Sun and Final Fantasy X, but I have not been... But while those were some of my formative RPG playing experiences early on, uh, Golden Sun on that Game Boy Advance and Final Fantasy X on the PlayStation 2, I haven't had a lot more of those. I've had a few, they don't immediately come to mind, but it's definitely been... It's been searching through the... the piles of rubble has been a thing whenever I want to try to find a memorable and interesting JRPG experience that is compatible with my taste and what I want out of a game. Uh, much like searching through anime, where it's just, it's... I don't know if it's just low quality or just incompatible with me, but man, it's hard to find an anime that I can get any enjoyment out of, and the games have followed suit. It's just interesting what... It's just interesting to me that specifically RPGs are the place where J where uh, Japanese games lose my interest, whereas other stuff can be really cool. Like, I, th I think at this point I'd rather play Catherine than any of the Persona games, for example. Because <laughs> it's... Pr it's got a... it's got weirder, crazier stuff going on on some level than... than the, uh, thing that it's famously supposed to be some kind of offshoot, uh... spin-off thing from... it's weird. I'm gonna let this topic die, because I don't know how much I could even... I'm closer to explaining it. It's been really ram- it's been especially rambly even for this series, so I'm gonna try to move on now. Uh, Daniel Leahy asks, I was wondering how you make enough time in the day to do everything you do. I've watched other YouTubers make it seem as though it takes a toll to even put two videos a day out- uh, put- uh, put out two videos a day, let alone six to eight I've seen, uh, a day in your channel. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I don't know as, as in response to other YouTubers, not how do I do my day. I know how my day works, because it's what I live, obviously. Uh, am, I play, am I getting the same figures over and over again, but with slightly different objectives or something? I'm a little confused by that. I didn't just pick the same one again, did I? Oh, well. I'm, I'm, I'm only kind of paying attention. This is actually... This works fairly well for answering questions. It's just like a zen... Um, well, yeah, that's what it's called, zen. Uh, so, how do I do my videos? So... With respect to how my channel, like my, I, I could I could just lay out my how my day works, I suppose, because that, that's one of the uh, questions that comes up from time to time. Uh, so, basically, I wake up in the morning, and I go to my computer, and I go to my new renders folder, because that's where I output to, and I get all of my videos that rendered last night, and I upload them to YouTube. I just drag them all to YouTube, usually in the chronological order in which they're supposed to go up, just because uh, you upload times and stuff. But what I do is I schedule them. There's a scheduling feature on YouTube. You can just upload a video and say, I want this to go up on January 27th at 6 p.m. You can only do half hour intervals, which is why on some versions of, of our schedule, we've had uh, half hour intervals on videos. I'm doing one hour video uh, intervals now. Give videos a little bit of space to breathe. Uh, so you can have videos go up at that interval. Uh, I don't know why I quit that one so early. I probably could have done more. So, I have the videos go up. What's going on here? Well, I can't go higher? Yeah, I can. Oh, no, I need three more lanterns, apparently. I'm le leaving this too early. Uh, weird. So, uh... Lost my train of thought a little bit. I schedule the- I drag all the stuff in by, into the, uh... From the new renders folder into the, uh, upload page. I schedule them, give them their names and their details, upload their thumbnails. You, you frustratingly have to kind of babysit this process because you can't upload thumbnails for games. 
uh, for videos until the the video is already in, either in the pro either in the process of uploading or done being uploaded, and it only uploads one video at a time. You can queue your uploads, but you can't you can't simultaneously upload. It'll just do the uploads uh, in order. So you can start setting up all the uh, video details in advance, but you can't you can't upload a thumbnail until the video itself is in progress. Uh, so you have to babysit the process in a way so that you, you can keep an eye on it so you can tell when it's time to upload each thumbnail for each video as you're going. And that's so that's a bit of a time-consuming process. So the morning's pretty much just chill, eating breakfast and watching YouTube videos or Netflix or something, or even sometimes even grinding in certain games that I'm that I'm that I need to do grinding in. Or even at or even editing something else uh, while I wait for the videos to uh, to upload. I did not do any better this time. This game is suddenly actually requiring some skill, apparently. Whoops. The uh, so so I'm, that's a that's just a waiting time, busy work. When that's when that's done, what I do is at some point I start recording. Uh, on a good day, I start recording nice and early in the morning after the after whenever the recordings uh, whenever the previous uploads are done. I have uh. I definitely have less uh, successful days where I procrastinate or things get in the way or I have to actually do grocery shopping or I'm I need to leave town that day and various other things mix things up but generally I can get started recording as soon as I can sort of will myself to start working for the day the worst part of this job not the worst part of this job, but the the complication related to this is just the constant being self-employed and having to be self-motivated and having to uh, tell yourself when to work, essentially. Because uh, when, you, when you're when you self-employed and work from home, it's incredibly easy to get distracted and put off work for just long enough, like, oh, one more YouTube video or one more other thing. And it's so easy to just not work as, as, uh, as dedicated as you should. This, this is why you hear about people like Dodger and Jesse Cox and The Completionist all having an office for their recordings. Uh, for someone like Rooster Teeth, it makes sense that they have an office because they have like an entire staff that works on various videos. But a lot of these independent YouTubers often have an office, and that's because having a dedicated place where they quote-unquote go to work uh, is... Like, that's important because it leads to a situation where they can actually force themselves to be in a different headspace where like, I am now at work, and that's important. Because uh, it means that they can enter a specific thought process of like, now I am at work, so I will now do things only related to work until I go home, at which point I can go back to goofing off. But I work from home. I work from literally the room that I sleep in, and I work at the computer that I use for entertainment, so it's very easy to get stuck. But generally, I've Generally, I, even if it t turns into procrastination, I can get the day's work done because as the, the later in the afternoon it gets, the more I'm like, oh god, I need to transition towards uh, actually recording videos for the day. As far as the current schedule goes, it used to be worse, but as of right now, my schedule now involves uh, the, the, a planned six videos per day, which is pretty manageable at the moment because uh, it's... It tends to be in the ballpark of three to four hours of uh, recording per day, because I do half an hour videos, and that's how math works. Uh, very variable as far as how many video, how efficient recording time goes. Unfortunately, depending on which game I'm playing that day and what kind of state that game is in at the moment. Uh, I've had parts of Morrowind, for example, or where I'm doing tons of travel time uh, and stuff like that, where like it can be hard to get. Uh, to, to efficiently get a 30 minute video out of 30 minutes of play, so often it's significantly more than that. Uh, it can be frustrating when I have too many games that take too long. But other games like Prey, you might have noticed every most episodes pick up where the last one ended, uh, pick, uh, ended off, and a lot of these narrative indie games I've been playing are also very efficient, where like the episodes go back to back and there's no real cuts going on. When I'm, when I'm nice and efficient, I can just crank out an entire day's videos very quickly. As a general rule, I don't really stop recording just because I've hit my quota. Because the, the idea being that, uh, it, like, if I, I basically stop recording when my day is over in this kind of situation. Am I, like, somehow not... Record... Uh, oh, am I somehow not unlocking enough of this? No, I'm, I'm fine. Never mind. I'm totally mixed up on how menus work a bit here. So, uh... 
I'll generally do... I'll try to do six videos a day, but I'll try to do more than that whenever possible. And, uh... I pretty much will just keep going if it's a work day, which is most days. Uh... Usually until something like... 11 o'clock at night, and then I'll start editing. Editing's time-consuming process, uh... Basically, what, oh, as far as how do I tell how many episodes I, in I am, that, that's actually variable, by the way. I, uh... I will, if I am, uh... For certain games, I'll just record a bunch, and then I'll cut it into episodes afterwards, and I actually won't know how many episodes it is until I edit it. This is pretty common for Mass Effect, it's pretty common for... Uh... Prey, just generally games where I'm... That, I, that are more bingy, and in many cases, Zelda is a very efficient, cl tight thing, but also a game where I need to be able to sync the audio and video because I'm playing it on console. So in Zelda's case, I, I sit there with a timer, and every 30 minutes, and I can pause and play the timer over, so that whenever I'm doing a jump cut, I can, with, where I know I'm doing a jump cut, I can then intentionally uh, add, add more time to the timer. But, uh, when a Zelda episode hits 30 minutes, I will then pause, and I'll- I'll sync the audio and video in my, uh... By going to a menu and being like, up, up, down, down, and stuff like that. I will specifically do a sync for Zelda over and over again throughout the recording, so I can keep making sure that the audio and video is in sync when I'm editing later. But most game- but most other games I can actually just binge if I have enough time that day. And so I'll often try to play... Often in the ballpark of, uh, two to three episodes worth or more per game per session. So I'm actually staggering things where I'm playing, like... On most days I'm playing two or three games, despite my six day- my six game schedule. Because I- the other games are being played on different days, usually. Uh, and it staggers and goes back and forth, which is way more manageable than playing, uh, multiple games per day on a large scale. Uh, there's generally a setup time for each game. You have to wait for it to load, you have to wait for the console to launch, or various other things, or you have to reorient yourself as to what you were doing last time and where you're gonna go, so... The fewer games played per day, the better. The more switching happens, the more... cut hard, difficult to get, it it becomes to be time efficient. Uh, when my vi when, my, when I'm done recording for the day, I start, uh, processing audio as the first step. You'll notice that I often compress audio so that- so that it's more... So you can hear the game, and you can hear myself, and it's balanced decently, because, uh, that's one of the nightmares of doing YouTube videos and for video games, especially with high, dyna high dynamic ranges, is trying to figure out how to hear the game and the person and make that all work. Uh, so processing audio takes some time. I'll often just launch a- uh, I'll often- this is the mindless part, where I basically watch a YouTube video and hang out while progress bars fill up, while I apply the usual filters and things like that to my stuff. Uh, then I could put it all into my editing software, and I just manually edit everything, every time. I don't- I do not have an editor. I'm not really interested in having an editor, because I want to have decent turnaround time for all of my videos, and, uh... Having an editor would involve, like, sending my files over the internet to another person, and then hoping that they do exactly what I want them to do, which is already- which is already a gamble in its own way. A Andrew actually tried having an editor at one, some po at one point, and it was act it was uh, making it very hard for him to put out videos on sad games. It was an experiment, and it wasn't one that was paying off. Uh, what what I do is I queue my recordings, which is which means that I I basically put brackets around the the thing that's going to be rendered, and then I just put and it's essentially flagging it for later, and then uh, I and then overnight that video will render, and. Uh, I'll go to bed, or watch stuff, or whatever, I'll move on for the for the day. And over the course of the night, I will render those videos, and they will all they will all render one by one, based on how I, I queued them, and in the morning they will be done. And that's, and that's, that's where we, we started the story with the, uh, me waking up in the morning and uploading all the videos that rendered the previous day. That's the cycle. Uh, it's not a gargantuan amount of time. Uh, it often takes all day, but that's m but some of that is definitely due to me, uh, wasting some of the day in the middle. Although you could say that that's basically- you could say that my- my midday slash morning period is similar to the average person's, uh, evening period after work. Because when I'm done with work, 
there's a relatively short amount of time between that and me uh, stopping for the day and going to sleep. So my after, so what normal people have is after work is more of a before work for me, I suppose. So it's not crazy that I waste some time there, but it definitely leads to variable output per day, which can be kind of frustrating. But generally, as far as I can tell, I don't think I, I don't really consider my, my schedule to be overworked. I, I was definitely overworking myself uh, back when I had my other, when I had another job that was working in parallel. Uh, cause I used to have a full-time job and then my YouTube channel. Uh, and that was taking up 100% of my time and was a nightmare. Uh, I was doing the YouTube channel cause I enjoyed it. So it's not complete. That's the, that's the, uh, do what you like whole, like paradox thing. That's always hard to figure. That makes it hard to quantify your work when you're doing a YouTube stuff is that, Hey, you want to do this, right? Uh, but that was definitely just too much time commit commitment back then. Nowadays, my full-time job is gone, and this is my full-time job, and I do treat it as a full-time job with full-time hours and everything like that, and I think that it's generally pretty reasonable, especially uh, now that I've established the specific six video per day schedule, like, I have found that my average day is reasonably what it should be, which is why I don't know the answer to your question. Uh, specifically, I don't, an I don't understand. I don't understand why your question is a question, and I'm not saying, I'm not, I'm not pointing that at you, uh, as in, like, how could you have that question? No, I mean, like, I am also, I also have that question. Because I watch YouTubers, and I hear them talk about how busy they are, these other Let's Play channels, and I, I just want to know what's going on in their lives when they say they're busy. Like, what's going on? Because there's so many things that it could be. Like, but I just don't know. Because, like, often because, like, the surprise for me is particularly that I, uh, the most of the Let's Players I watch are not editing heavy. Like, Video Game Donkey is a channel that ha makes a highlight video, and it's a comedy video with, like, in a way, it has, like, a script, essentially. Uh, not, not literally a script, but he, uh, he plays through a game in its entirety, usually, it seems, and he does that every single week, I think, and he needs to make a comedy video that has, like, an ongoing narrative and a series of jokes, and, like, he, he has to develop a thing and figure out what to do with it. That... That, I understand why that would take time. It's just like trying to make a fully edited video review that uses all, uses all this footage to reinforce all the stuff you scripted, like that, or the, soupy, the, or the super bunny hop thing. Like that stuff all makes sense to me why it would take all week to make. Uh, but Let's Play videos, like a lot of Let's Play videos that I, that I watch specifically are just a, a dude playing a game for 15 minutes or, or half an hour or something and uploading that with like no real editing done to it and so i'm super confused why these people are busy because you just do the math right like those people will like look at game grumps for example because that's a, a long-standing example they're relatively they're relatively clear about how their schedule works a little bit at least the recording schedule which makes it all the more confusing when you try to figure out what what they where the busy part comes from at times like they make these like 10 minute videos and they do two of them per day right now. So that means that they record 14 videos per week at t at uh, 10 minutes long, which is not huge. And, e and even they are generally pretty uh, clear about the fact that they tend to make uh, all of their videos in a single day. They have a single long recording session where they apparently record 14 videos in one session, which admittedly seems a little bit long for one day, but... It's, if, it's that, if that's the only recording day that all week they do, then that's... Uh, I understand. So then you would think, oh, well, they edit their videos, right? But they don't. In, like, both aspects of the idea. Like, their videos don't really have much going on in their videos as far as, like, special things editing-wise. It's pretty much just cut and dry. Starts here, ends here, put the put the uh, theme song in, put the end card there. Like, that's, that's really quick work as far as editing goes. Uh... Which is fine if that's all they want to do, but then they talk about being busy all the time, and I kind of wonder what how they like. I, in in their case, I think they they've slowly added more and more things to their list. Uh, nowadays, I more or less understand why they're busy because uh, one of them is making music, and the and they do touring and stuff like that. But once upon a time, none of that was part of the equation, and they still talked about themselves being busy. So I I thought that maybe. Maybe it's a matter of them, like... Maybe... I think that 
what might be an ongoing thing is that perhaps YouTubers make have merchandise, and maybe they have to handle their own merchandise in some cases. A lot of YouTubers have merchandise, and I think what happens is that they order the merchandise from the people making it, and then it's, I think it might arrive at their office in many, in many YouTubers' cases, and then those people have to figure out how to... Like, they have to get take the information of all the people who ordered it and send it off to them and package it, and, like, that's tons of work. So that might be a thing that keeps some YouTubers busy. Uh, as far as... Uh, let's see... Like, merchandise might be one thing. Uh, some people have, like, sponsor deals or weird jobs, like... Jesse Cox, I was uh, for a while I was confused, like, how he taught- how he gets busy, because he makes, like... Last- I haven't checked super recently, but when I was checking before, he seemed to make one video a day or less than one video a day. And I would notice that because he does, like, a Fan Friday thing, and that Fan Friday thing would be, like, only one out of every, like, four or five videos, which means that, like, like, he wasn't even making seven videos a day. Uh, but, like, he shows up in weird random shows, so I'm guessing that some- I'm guessing that when a YouTuber becomes significantly famous, if they so desire, they may be saying yes to all sorts of deals for doing various shows, be it for YouTube Red or Geek and Sundry or whoever happens to be knocking on their door. And, you know, I don't- I won't begrudge anyone saying yes to work. So that might be the behind-the-scenes thing that's going on. It's kind of like how when YouTube killed off animations by changing the algorithm that ultimately led to Let's Plays doing so well. Uh, for a while there, uh, animations were just dying and they still are dead, basically. So all these animation channels disappeared for years and everyone was like, Oh, what happened? Is they, are they dead and stuff like that? Like, are your hairy partridges and whatnot, but like... The inevitable answer is that those people moved on to other so forms of work, and so it seems like they're not doing anything, but in the background they're actually working on crazy, uh... Like, they're working in animation studios. They got- they often got work outside of- it because they had to leave YouTube. Uh, so, like, there's a lot of different stories going on behind the scenes for different people. I definitely wonder what the average day is for a lot of certain people, like... I, I definitely am surprised how often I find out that a, a YouTuber hires a editor for their channel that doesn't really have editing. Like, a lot of channels are, as I've said before, are just like, video starts here, ends here, maybe put a title card or a intro song in that's a prefabricated clip you just drag in. Like, knowing how to edit videos here, I'm like, I don't understand what how there's enough work to justify hiring a person to do it, in many cases. Uh... I understand editing when it comes to something like Rooster Teeth's Achievement Hunter videos where they have multiple perspective cameras and it's tons of work, which as you'll see because it takes me a long ass time to get around to these Dark Souls 3 co-op videos sometimes because it just, that it's just a lot of work to do that kind of editing as opposed to just saying start here, end here, and then rendering it. So I'm surprised when I hear the like... I, I'm surprised when I hear about like Best Friends Play saying they're hiring an editor and I'm like, an editor? To do... What, though? I don't understand what the editor's job is and why it was necessary. And I wonder if, like, if, uh, I, I do wonder which, which, uh, Let's Play channels are genuinely busy because of stuff that we don't see, or are just not that busy and they're just riding on the general success of their channel, which I don't really begrudge them either. But I hope that none of, I hope that those people don't pretend to be busy. Because that's, it's... It is a general weird feeling. Like, I, I am familiar with this narrative of less players being super busy, and you might think that's... Well, that's a weird narrative to hear compared to, like, me and Wanderbot, uh, who you will both see. Uh, you see both of us making tons of videos all the time. And even Birdcatcher, who has a full-time job and, and is, like, exhausted all the time from that. Even he's, like, putting out, like, several videos a day now. And, like, so it's, like... It is- it does raise questions from time to time, from person to person, but it's so case by case that it's very hard to tell what's going on with each person. They could be busy with all sorts of behind the scenes things, or other projects, or other elements of their lives. Or they might just even have, like, weird, like, work ethic issues where they just don't have good time management skills, maybe, or... There's, there's a lot of things that could be going on, and I'm sure that the answers are all different for every single one of them. But, uh... My answer is generally that m doing my output is a pretty reasonable thing, generally. 
for a human being that has a normal workday. Like, it's pretty manageable. The only thing that's not manageable right now is that I can't, uh... I can't deal with making, uh... 1080p 60 videos right now. Uh, the issue with 1080p 60 is that when you set it to render, it's just, it takes an eternity, and the 1080p, the 1080p part is way worse than the 60 frames per second part, by the way. Uh, just, it's way, way more data. Uh, that part is gonna take some time to get around to. I would love to ultimately have all of my videos be in 1080p 60, but I don't know when that'll be feasible. Uh, it would, that's the type of thing that would likely require either a full-time editor or a, uh, or more likely a, like a, a render farm, essentially, a dedicated computer for rendering. Because my issue right now is just that, like, I will set videos to render overnight, and then I'll wake up in the morning, and they're still, like, far away from being done rendering. And, like, that's not an easy thing to solve, because then I'm like, well, I need to get to work on recording the next videos, and, like, uh, th this thing, this whole, like, work loop only works if it can be done every 24 hours, and if my videos can't be put into 1080 overnight, then that means that, like, I can't make them daily. So I, that means my choice, my, I, had, I had the choice of either making my videos in 1080 or making fewer videos, and I like the current way my channel works, so I'd rather not, I'd rather stick to the current way the channel works rather than making 1080 and, and uh, so maybe one day I'll have a nice open living space where I can have room for a second computer and then I can render stuff overnight and stuff like that. But uh, as of right now, I don't think that's not feasible. And I talk about full-time editor not because, uh, like not because I think the editing itself takes the work, but just because I can offload the files to somebody else and they can edit it and render it on their own time and not have to deal with the fact that they need to like do what I need to do, which is actually make videos. <laughs> Uh, so it's, it's, uh, less because it has less to do with the editing taking work and more with the idea of, like, I can't be in two places at once doing two different things at once, so a time management thing would be to offload the work onto a second person, as opposed to it being a thing I can't do myself because of any sort of skill reason. So that's my really meandering response to that question. Uh, in summary, like, yeah, I mean, I guess that was already was in summary. Uh, ultimately, basically, like, I guess, yeah, like, I think my, I think my job's doable, and if you want to know why your favorite YouTuber, uh, is busy all the time or something, or whoever you're talking about, and you don't understand why, then, uh, you could try, I mean, the best solution would be that if they have a exactly identical Q&A series as I do, where they're willing to go way too in detail with questions and give you nice detailed answers to stuff that's off, that's crazy like that, then, then that would be helpful, and they could, then you could know. But most people aren't very transparent about this kind of thing, and this might be seen as a more of a behind-the-scenes personal question that maybe they don't want to answer, and I can't begrudge them that either, but then you won't know your answer, I suppose. Uh, that's it. <laughs> that's it. Try to ask them on Twitter, maybe, or that's, Twitter's not a good place to answer questions with long answers. But like you can try to you can try to ask them, and if they don't answer, then that's that's the end of the of that's the end of this mystery. You never find out. Whoops. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end it there. Go ahead and send your questions to keithballardquestions at gmail.com. Uh, I feel really disorganized and spacey today, so I don't. Hopefully, my answers generally made sense. It not, it's not always easy to fully structure my approach to these things. I try not to give micro answers like I've seen Q&A shows on other channels where somebody a question pops up and then somebody gives like a one sentence answer that like isn't comprehensive or might even be a joke answer in its own right and so on and so forth so like aside from joke questions I generally try to give it a proper conci not concise but, co but a thorough and a complete answer an answer that even answers other questions that weren't asked that are related to it and gives them and tries to complete the thought and so on but it's not it's definitely not easy to do unless i was going to sit here and write an essay response to each one that i could then proofread several times which i don't see fitting into my schedule so it's probably always going to be stream of consciousness responses uh so hopefully i answer the question 
as intended eventually <laughs> and bring in information that's hopefully entertaining or something or interesting and hopefully everything I'm saying makes sense and eventually manages to form some kind of point. Uh, thanks for watching like always guys and I'll see you next time.